They create a hub, they go back in time, they get rid of the time devices, that's usually what they're doing, or they bring somebody in to recruit them, or they might need to kill somebody if they do things out of line. Bruce was there at the beginning, the guy kills his father, he comes back, he gets hit by a car, and he dies. The time fabric corrects itself. They've had to stop allowing people to do time travel except for these very specific things because there were so many time paradoxes, they were very worried about whether our reality would even hold together. Because if you have a spaceship, and if you don't have a buffer on time travel on it, people can go back and do all kinds of crazy stuff. So the time travel stuff is very, very highly regulated. It's very, very highly protected. But it totally makes sense that if the government is now telling us that crash retrievals are real, and nobody really cares because there's all this other stuff to worry about, like your freaking city is on fire, then yeah, you're not so concerned about partial disclosure they're going to have to up the ante. They're going to have to do more. All right, so getting back to my slides now, because um, I don't want to go too much more than this. 9 o'clock is 11 o'clock on the East Coast, so we're already getting into like the three, three and a half hours now. Um, DARPA actually developed the IP addresses that we use on the Internet from studying this gate network. So going back a couple slides, again, this is apparently our gate address, which is kind of similar to an IP address. Although IP addresses are only four digits and they all are between uh, 0 and 255. But apparently these guys in the, in the classified programs um, developed the whole internet protocol that we're now using by studying this gate network. So the ancient gates were, were built for peaceful travel. You can't bring a weapon. Some guys tried, but it never worked. Uh, some people lost dental work. If you haven't, if you've had recent dental work and it hasn't gotten your bio imprint, you might lose a filling in your teeth when you go through these old things. But the new stuff, uh, the, the portals that we're talking about that are Montauk related, you don't go through a wormhole. You just walk in one side and out the other and there's no big tube ride, which again makes you crazy. So that's the one you want to do. You want to do a modern portal. You don't want to do an ancient portal because you'll never come back. Or if you do, you're all screwed up. So in the beginning, they were sending homeless people through, and they were dying, and then they eventually figured out how to get all this stuff to work and how to see where they were going and, and learning about time paradoxes and how to prevent people from finding these ancient machines that could do this, of which there's apparently many of them all throughout time and space that people could find. And so now here we are, that they've transmitted this plan back to the 1950s, and we're seeing the plan get fulfilled. Well, I'm going back now to Stargate SG-1, to get back into my slides, and one of the most amazing things that Bruce ever showed me was this one episode of Stargate SG-1 called Wormhole Extreme. And this is actually a, a shot from the show uh, in which they actually create a fake show. And notice the Stargate looks different. If you've seen the real show, the Stargate looks a little cheesier and cheaper. And then the people are, of course, different. And the guy that was Teal'c, um, the black guy, now he's, he's all silver, which in, in reality he isn't. And it's very, very campy. Uh, and this guy is actually saying, what do you mean this isn't a real show? This is not a real show? You mean this isn't a real show? And so it's like they're, they're really, really rubbing it in your face, teasing you by basically telling you like that, that, that it's actually real. Because you look at Stargate SG-1, you watch the credits, and they always say sponsored by the Department of Defense. So this is one of the things they put out there to get us acclimated to the truth. So the Wormhole Extreme episode is extremely weird because the, the, it's basically revealing that the show is not fiction. And that the people in the, they're making fun of the people in the show. So the people in the show don't understand that everything that's going on is actually true. And I believe that the Stargate people, the real Stargate people, find out that the show was being made. And so there's this interesting crossover where it becomes pretty obvious, like they're almost, like when a kid is lying, he covers his mouth. They're telling you that this is not fiction. But again, all of this will, will come out eventually when we get full disclosure. So getting back to the slides once more, uh, we find out that Time travel is routine. It's happening regularly for these specific purposes to stop paradoxes. And I only found out the details recently. That was, so that, that's one of the bulk of the things that I wanted to get through. If I had the time, I was going to do these 
extra slides with Pete Peterson, which I now will do. So we're going to pivot away from Montauk Daniel, because I've given you basically everything I got on him. I don't really think I left anything out. Years later, in 2009, uh, I came in contact with Dr. Pete Peterson because Kerry Cassidy of Project Camelot sent me a recording, and I listened to this, and I said, we got to get this guy right now. I'll pay for it. I'll pay for your flight. I'll pay for the hotel. We're getting out to Garden Valley, Idaho, which is where he lived, because now that he's dead, we can talk about that. Uh, he lived in Garden Valley, Idaho, beautiful, beautiful mountain country in a big valley, lots of pine trees. And what he was saying was just so unbelievable. It was very obvious that he knew a lot of stuff. Before he died, he told me he'd been to over 30 different off-planet locations, and I do have that recording somewhere. I think it's back in L.A. because I thought it was here, and I was going to try to bring it out. But I, I think I know where the machine is now, but I do have that recording. He didn't go into a whole lot of detail, but he said that he'd been to about 30 different off-planet locations. He said, Americans are all over the galaxy. One of the cool things I heard from another insider who shall not be named is that uh, there, if you want to know where the reptilians are, go to Rigel. And there's tons and tons of reptilians in the Rigel star system. Another thing he told me is that one of the closest planets to Earth that's habitable, it's only 40 light years away, is a lot bigger than the Earth, and it is a Hawaii planet. The whole planet doesn't tilt on its axis, and it's all tropical. And lots of different extraterrestrial human groups go there for vacation. And it's literally right next door. So once we get more disclosure, I want to go to that planet. I want to hang out, and I want to really take a vacation and talk to some cool people and learn some cool things and have telepathic interactions with them because a lot of these ETs are telepathic. So when I got to Pete Peterson, it was an absolute game changer. I paid for Carrie and me to go out there, and then Bill Ryan flew out from, uh, he was in Switzerland at the time. We ended up doing an event in Switzerland very soon after that in Zurich. Um, and that's where actually Henry Deacon came forward on stage for the first time, which was remarkable. Because I was just calling him my Uncle Mark and saying that he was a family member. And then when he said he was going to come up on stage, it was stunning. And he's never wanted to come forward again. He only did it for a little bit in 2009, and then he stopped. And he and I haven't even spoken in five years, but um, we had a little difference of agreement. If he's still alive, I'd love to reconnect with him. I hope he's ready to talk more now. But uh, Henry Deacon, by the way, uh, would travel through a military base in England and go to Mars. That's what he said, that he went through a portal, he traveled to Mars, do his job, and then come back to the planet. And when he went and looked at the exact coordinates on Mars where he was working and the facility that he knew was supposed to be there, the facility did not exist in our reality right now. So he figured out that they were sending him to work on Mars in the future because, again, time doesn't really matter. So they can work far enough in the future. They build bases in the future that we don't see and that's when they get the work done. And then the worker comes back and he doesn't even know that he was in a different time. Because as long as they shift your ZTR, which now they do it very automatically, it's no big deal, it's not dangerous. One of my insiders absolutely refuses to go through the portal. He'll only travel by a spaceship, uh, which is really funny. So he's obviously not time-traveled. Uh, but apparently it's very safe. And, uh, you know, you're not going to have any body parts get rearranged or anything like that. It's, it's time-honored. It's tested through many, many civilizations. I'll take it. I'll take the ride. I'll do it. And I'm sure you probably want to do it too. So anyway, when we got to Pete Peterson, it was stunning because he had so many pieces of information. And I'm way over time. I don't want to go too much longer here. It's already almost 11 o'clock over there, but I got to get through this before we end tonight. So check this out. Uh, in this original interview with Project Camelot, the, the video that we put out there um, in early, it was like July 2009, although I don't think they actually released it because there was a whole kerfuffle with Pete where he didn't want it to come out. They didn't actually publish it, I think, until August or September, even though the interview was in July. This is the link for the transcript. The video, of course, is still available, projectcamelot.org. Kerry Cassidy did give, did give me permission to use excerpts from the video, but I have not done that yet. Um, I just didn't have time, and it's also too dangerous to do it on a live stream for the content ID stuff. So this is one of the things that Pete said that's very, very relevant to what's going on right now while he was interviewing 
with uh, Bill Ryan, and Bill Ryan was asking him questions. Uh, he says, I'm in an area, this is Garden Valley, Idaho, that had two requirements for me, and for some of the people who I do various things for that are not to be named, isn't that intriguing? One of them is this area that he's living in is very secluded from man-made electromagnetic radiation, which again makes you more psychic, among other things. It's a deep valley with high mountains surrounding it in 360 degrees. The entrance to it is through a very narrow, long, winding canyon. So we don't really get radio here or television directly. The power that comes in here does have interference on it, as well as it has information on it. And that's his whole consciousness science informational field, as he calls it. But it's very, very secluded informationally, so he gets really nice psychic access by being in nature. And that's what I'm getting right here where I am. Then, the place that I chose here is kind of back in a little notch in the mountains, so it's even more secluded. That was one reason. The other reason is it's an area that's very highly defendable. That was very important because of my belief, and the belief of many other people that I have great respect for, that the world is going through a, I'll call it a meltdown. I've been led to believe in numerous briefings and people who I know in fields that very definitely would know, they've all warned me that I should be at a place like this. Well, why? You're going to find out. Many people, even those from Europe and other places that had very heavy financial connections in major cities around the world, have closed those offices down. A great number of them have expressed a desire to move here if they haven't already moved here. So people know some big, big, bad stuff is going down, which is kind of what we're seeing now. That's the whole point. This is 2009 that this was done. It's easy to prove. Go back to the link, look at the video, it's 2009. I moved here because I was told by various people that I should geolocate and be in an area that would be safe when we eventually got a financial and therefore a political collapse. Whoa. So there are certain things that I've done to make sure that myself and my family, you got to say my family and me, Pete, come on, and my friends are safe from that. We've heard that things are going to happen, things are going to fail, but life continued on as normal. And the government continued to print money and pass it out to its friends out of thin air. I moved here in 1999 because I was told that by 2001, the system was going to fail. And this, of course, was the events that took place in 2001. How did they know about that in advance? Hmm, I wonder. I'm not going to speculate. You speculate for me, please. I think you know the answer. Here we are eight years later or nine years later. And then uh, Bill says, in fact, you were ordered to come here. And he says, I was. So they knew something heavy was going to go down in 2001. All right, let me go back to, you can see my, my visage on camera for a minute here. So, all right. It appears that the high-level cabal people knew about this back in around maybe as early as 1994, 95. They were given briefings about what was going to happen. The original plan was to, to, to quote-unquote, decapitate the snake. The original plan was five cities, massive destruction, much bigger than what actually ended up happening, which was only confined to two areas reasonably close to each other. The original plan was much worse, and they expected that by doing this, that they this meaning what, what we saw happen in 2001, that... Society would collapse, the economy would collapse, rioting, starvation, chaos, and no return. So they ordered Pete to move to Idaho. All these countries in this area, uh, the Mormon area, like, you know, uh, Idaho, um, Montana, they call that Mormania. Pete originally called it as a joke, and then they started actually calling it that informally. They, they can close off Mormania, dynamite all the roads, and lock it off so that nobody else can get in, and then there's plenty of food, plenty of water, and everything like that. Um, so that whole area around Idaho, Utah, that's all part of it. Um, I don't think that's going to be necessary. I don't see society going totally nuts like this, but here he was on camera saying he got, he, 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 again, he believed in this enough to actually move. So this is very important. All right, let's go back to the slide. 
So he was ordered to come there in 1999. Uh, he was told the system was going to fail. Uh, so we found out that no, the system didn't fail. I'd go for a briefing and they would be in total shock. We don't understand why society has not collapsed. We don't have any idea why it hasn't failed. Remember, this is 2009. I mean, we just don't know because they really thought it was going to work. The only thing we can do is say there was so much inertia, there was so much getting in the way. How would this ever be possible? If somebody wanted to do this, how do you actually make it happen, right? So now it's beginning to fail. And it's, it isn't just beginning to fail, it's increasing on a logarithmic scale. This was after 2008 economic collapse, right? And it's been hell ever since then. And this was 2009, so one year later. And very shortly, I see that it just about has to do that. It has to collapse. And this was in 2009, folks. Wow. I've, I've put my money and my talent, my skills and my abilities where my mouth is. I've come here and I'm self-sufficient. I grow all my own meat, all my own vegetables. That's not really true, but he does exaggerate sometimes. We have to forgive him for that. I have stored up those things that are going to be critical to society. He did have all the equipment to grow his own meat, and he did grow some vegetables. That is true. Uh, so it's not entirely false, but I, I don't think he had any chickens or anything at the time that I was there. Uh, I've picked up the tools that I didn't have that allow me to do things in such an environment, in such a society, to produce things that are going to be necessary for people to have. And he goes into a long tangent on all that stuff, which I'm not going to read. So what happens is if we have a financial collapse, if, as in when, it won't be like the Great Depression in the 1920s. Of course, it's going to be much worse. It's going to be like today. And they're expecting what they're probably hoping for, some, some people, some negative people, you're going to have anarchy and absolute chaos. Well, it sure looks like somebody's trying to push that on us right now. And that's why I say we need that meditation practice. You got to do this regularly in your life. The government knows that. They know that that will happen with the economic collapse. They've recently asked the service members if they would fire on civilians if they were asked to, which is entirely against the Constitution. In later briefings that I had with them, anybody who said, no, I would never fire on a civilian, my oath of enlistment prohibits me from doing that, they got moved to different military bases than where they were, and within two years, those bases were decommissioned, and they all lost their jobs. The military at the time, the Bush and Clinton administrations, only kept the people who said they would fire on unarmed civilians. These guys who got kicked out realized what happened. They started organizing. They began working together. And apparently one of the places they did this was Paris. Paris was a major hub for the alliance back when all this stuff was happening, beginning in the uh, 1990s. So he says, I can't imagine anyone accepting the job of the president with the current situation. I can't even imagine it. I know that when he got his first brief... I know, he's talking about Obama now. When he got his first briefing, because I had friends who were present, he was so shocked that he had to sit down when he found out what was really happening. This was before he took the office. Okay, that's all he says in the interview about that, that Obama gets some kind of funny briefing and it made him very upset. Pete went into way, way more detail later on, and I've disclosed this in my articles on my website, divinecosmos.com. D-I-V-I-N-E-C-O-S-M-O-S dot com. Go back to where it says uh, David's blog. Click on that. There's like about 17 links, 17 tabs. Seven, there's a bunch of numbers, and you go back far enough, and you'll read my stuff from like 2011, 2010, when I start to talk about this. Okay, so where did this happen, and what happened to Obama? Well, it was the meeting of the presidents after he won the election, before he got inaugurated. So here he is talking to uh, Bush Sr. Now notice actually something very interesting. Notice the way that Obama is folding his hands. In terms of body language, he is shielding his core. He's shielding his lower chakras. He's shielding his, his waist and groin area. And that's an armoring because he feels unsafe. He's, he feels threatened. Something's wrong. And he's still got his hands in that position there while they're chuckling it up. And he's still got his hands in that same position. Notice it's still happening as he turns and he talks to George W. So he's smiling, but he's very, very nervous. Now look at George Bush Sr. and look at how nervous he looks. 
And you'll see why he was so nervous in a minute. And he looks even more nervous in this next picture. Notice Obama is still shielding himself. Oh, and by the way, if you look at Carter, I mean, Carter is like standing way the hell away from everybody else because he is spooked out. He does not want to be near anybody, right? So notice that. So Carter knows what's going on. He doesn't like it, but he was there and he showed up. He's a good soldier. Look at how nervous Bush looks. And then after this happened, uh, there, there's, a, there's a thing where Bush, is, is, Bush Sr. is going to shake somebody's hand. He's all nervous, and he has a, a, a napkin in his hand. And as he reaches out for the handshake, the napkin is still in his hand, and it's all weird because his hand's all sweaty, and he acts really awkwardly. Well, why was Bush so nervous, and why does he look so nervous in this picture? Okay, The reason he looks so nervous in that picture according to this briefing from Pete Peterson, everybody on the inside knows about this, is that right after this, and you can look up the date of that, that, that uh, thing they had, uh, I guess it was in 2008, because it was a 2008 election, it was before 2009, that you can read in the original reports that Bush and Obama had a private meeting, Bush Sr. and Obama had a private meeting that lasted about 20 minutes. Nobody else went in. According to Pete Peterson, there was a guy who was in a telephone booth and after the meeting was over, Obama staggered out of the room, put his head in his hands, and cried, my God, they made the N-word, I'm not going to say it, a scapegoat. That's how, he, that's how he said it. My God, they made the N-word a scapegoat. And he was crying and sobbing and heaving. But what we found out was that during that meeting, he was called the N-word repeatedly, multiple times, this man, Bush Sr., was vicious. His teeth were bared. Look, you effing da 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 And he said all this kind of stuff to him. Now that, it is one of the most heartbreaking things. I mean, honest to God. I know this is true, folks. And he did not deserve that. But Obama, what the hell are you doing, man? You need to stop this shit. If you study the letter that I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, then I would recommend going and looking. But, you know, they threatened him. And uh, it's, it's very, very sad because they, they told him that he would be killed if he resisted the plan. And uh, his family made a decision that he was not going to participate in what he wanted to do, which was to bring them down. They hazed him very badly in the beginning. They, they buzzed Air Force One. And there's a whole other thing that I'm going to do later on about that. Um, but, I mean, you look at the look on this man's face and you think about what he was about to do. It's crazy. I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry. I don't like this. I don't like talking about this stuff. Some things I don't mind talking about. I don't like talking about this. What the hell are you doing, dude? You got to stop this. You can't. You got to make those calls and you got to think about what you're doing. And you have to think about the steps that you people are taking and what you think is okay to get to the goal that you think you have. For God's sake, take the deal. Take the deal and stop this. There's a lot of people who are going to be able to get out of this, okay? But you have to take the deal and you have to cooperate. You're going to lose. You're not going to win. It's inevitable. We already know because the future timeline is fixed. This particular timeline that we're on leads to your defeat. There is no getting around that. And you are just sore losers and you are not being in integrity. But you don't care. And you're putting us all through hell and it needs to stop. And we need to take a stand because you might hate this guy, okay? You might hate the guy. And I get that. But if you don't do this, we are screwed, man. So you need to get out there. And you need to make that vote happen. 
Because they have 80 million false ones. That's what we're seeing. Okay, it's, it's going to be disputed. It's not going to be easy. And they have teams from Nicaragua, El Salvador, Mexico, they brought up here. All right, and they're in position. I don't know how bad it's going to get. They're going to they're gonna make it so scary to go to a polling place that nobody wants to go to vote because you're going to get shot. That's what they're trying to do, folks. You think this is all natural? You think nobody's coordinating any of this stuff? You think I want to talk about this? You think I want to be up here on this fucking camera talking about this shit? I'm sorry. I didn't know it was going to get like this. I didn't know it was going to get this bad. And I'm the positive guy. I mean, I always try to make it positive. But this is just crazy. And if you can't see what's going on, I'm sorry. If you think this is all natural, I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry that you haven't been willing to take that step and feel like throwing up and go through this grief process that I'm going through right now. But you have to do it, okay? You have to go through this. You have to see who these people are and see what they would do. and They would call somebody those kind of things and threaten them like that. And threaten him that his daughters are going to be raped in front of him and killed. I don't support that kind of stuff, folks. I don't. You can't do that to people. But they do. Okay? And it's part of the problem. Is that this is all real. Okay? They are doing some very nasty stuff. I gotta pull it together. I'm really sorry. I did not expect that this was gonna happen. (laughs) Holy crap. I'm good. You got to do the work. It's work. It's work to take this on. It's work to believe that this is real. It's work to go to bed at night knowing that you're going to wake up in a world where this shit is happening. And I'm sorry. I didn't want it to be like this, and I thought we could work hard enough that it would be quick and easy, that three days of darkness would come very, really soon. They were going to do it, but it's gonna be in, it won't be until they need to. Oh, God. And honestly, if you're a spiritual person, and you understand that we're all one, and that the teaching is forgiveness and love, you got to rise above all the currents of hatred. you got to rise above... All the stuff that's trying to tell you to be mean to other people and to hurt them and to threaten them and to lie to them. And that it's okay to organize a little, a little insurrection, you know. Oh, man. I miss one thing to, to, you know, have heard about this stuff in 2009. It's quite another to be here on the ground looking at it and dealing with it. And I'm sorry that I haven't talked to you more. But it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming to know what I know. And to know that I could lose my channel. Just for telling you the truth. The truth is it was told to me. I can't prove some of this stuff. Some of it I can. I'm just telling you what I know. Because I don't want this, this reality. I don't, I don't want to lose that timeline. And we, we don't have to lose that timeline. The Great Awakening is how we get through this, everybody. We all have to solve the easy mystery. Gosh, okay, I gotta stop. I gotta stop crying and I just gotta get back to work. Okay. Anyway, you saw the picture, you saw the look on his face. That's because of what he was about to do and he had the hanky in his hand. He was all sweaty and he ruined that man's life. I mean, I I really do. Barry, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm sorry that happened to you, man. I really am sorry. But you gotta stop this crap. You gotta stand down. We'll give you some some breaks. We'll we'll acknowledge what you went through at this point. I don't have the same view of you that some people do. I didn't hate you. I didn't I voted for you, man. But this is crazy. You gotta stop. God, I'm sorry, I didn't expect to do that. All right, I'm pulling it together. Would you confirm this is in the interview, would you confirm? That there are good people who have, we've euphemistically called white hats. Which I don't like that term, and I'm sorry that's in there. <laughs> Sounds too much like KKK. That's not at all what it is, folks. It's not racist. And it's not anything like that. 
They're just it's just one old name for the good guys that I retired immediately back in nineteen in two thousand nine. In the government and the military, good guys who themselves are patriots as you are, and they're trying to do their best from the inside to avert these catastrophes, which again is what seems to be happening now. And he said, yes, absolutely, the alliance is real. There are many people who left the military. Most of the good people left during Clinton and Bush, because this is when they were talking about the firing, apparently, according to these briefings. They couldn't pledge allegiance to the president because of the things that were being done. So many people left. Well, they went to Paris, as we found out. Some of them did. On the other hand, there were many people who stayed behind because they knew they were going to be needed. And this is what eventually turned into the alliance, the magic letter, all that stuff. You're hearing about it back in 2009, folks. They sacrificed. God damn. Your presenter is not doing a good job. I'm sorry. You think this is fake or you think this is anti-Semitic or something? Nothing to, this is not a Jewish conspiracy. Come on. They sacrificed not principle, but they had a higher knowledge. And they stayed behind so they could apply the knowledge they had when the time came. Now, why did I bold higher knowledge? I bolded higher knowledge because the higher knowledge is, is this information that came from the future. Okay? That's how the plan was written. That's how the binder was made. They saw what needed to be done. They saw how the time was going to flow. And they saw the steps that needed to be taken. It was originally going to be done with force. And they wanted to do it legally. They asked this man to run who was not a politician. Therefore, he still makes lots of mistakes all the time. You know? And I'm not saying that I agree with a lot of those things that he says. I don't. Okay? I emphatically don't in some cases. But that's what happens when you get a real guy who hasn't trained his whole life for this. <laughs> And he's not perfect. None of us are. And his imperfections are very obvious. But the Alliance knows who this dude is. They've done all the background checks. The other candidate can't talk about it. But you can look online and find a whole lot of stuff if you do a little digging. So when he talks about this higher knowledge, uh, that's from the future. That's what he's talking about. That's the plan. They could, and just remember, this came out in 2009, so they already knew about it back then. They stayed behind. They're still there now. They could apply the knowledge that they had when the time came. <clears throat> That's where they thought they would be the most valuable. That's where they thought they would be the most valuable. He repeats it. And they were the true patriots because they did what was best for the people. <laughs> Rather than what was best for themselves. Boy, do I know that one. And these are the people who are keeping you informed sometimes. Is that right? Some of those people are the people who are keeping me informed. And by the way, folks, speaking as David, they're the same people who I'm working with now and stuff that I'm not going to say just quite yet. <laughs> do you know anything or suspect anything about how once the financial system fails, if it does so, what would it be replaced by? Well, up until a few days ago, I would say it would have been replaced by a world currency. This is the briefings he got, okay? And I'm not saying it's going to be a world currency, by the way. But the basic idea of collateral, I do agree with. Remember, the last four presidents have all been members of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is not necessarily very good. They have openly stated that they're moving toward a one-world government and believe we should have a one-world government. If we had a one-world government, which again, I don't agree with, we'd probably have a one-world currency. Again, the financial reset is not this New World Order wet dream, so please don't think that's what we're really saying is going to happen. It's not. And it might even be they were smart enough to have a currency that was backed by something real, like gold or silver or various metals. That's real collateral. I've always wanted to see commodity-backed currency. So you could have a currency that was worth so much corn or so much wheat or so much of something that was a real, tangible thing. Now, he said up until, up until yesterday, that's what I thought it was going to be. Um, but 
then he was talking about NAFTA and he kind of trailed off and it doesn't really go anywhere, what, what his other idea was. But this concept of the currency being backed by collateral, it's not going to be a world currency. It's not going to be a world government. Okay, that's crazy. Uh, unless it was something very peaceful and amazing and everybody still had their rights as individuals and in states and countries. Uh, maybe we could do it. I don't know. But it sounds pretty crazy to me. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, unless we're in a totally different world where it's a lot more peaceful. Anyway, currencies being rebooted with collateral, yes, absolutely, that's what we're looking at. And remember, he stated this in mid-July 2009. This is when the interview took place. And it was during this time that he started to brief me afterwards. We start talking on the phone two hours at a time. And we're doing this regularly, like two or three times a week. And shortly thereafter, this article comes out, and it was an inside leak, and everybody has forgotten about it. And in the era that's going on right now, I think it's very important that we look at this again. And I'm almost done, folks, so I thank you for staying up with me on the East Coast. It's now 1120. You're a trooper. Thank you. Or come back tomorrow if you, if you can wait, <laughs> I guess. All right. <clears throat> so... This was in July, and then this article, this amazing, amazing, amazing article, came out on Tuesday, 6 October 2009, as you can see here. Now, what does it say? The demise of the dollar, this is UK independent, very, very credible mainstream media. In a graphic illustration of the New World Order, right, they're blaming the, they're, they're blaming the alliance, they're calling the alliance the New World Order, it's such projection. In a graphic illustration of the New World Order, Arab states have launched secret moves with China, Russia, and France to stop using the U.S. currency for oil trading. So here it is. And here's the link, and it still works as of right now. I'll bet you it doesn't work very long, so pause the tape, copy it down, type it in, or we'll, we'll knock it into the uh, description field in, you know, soon. Um, but anyway, it works as of today. <laughs> Probably not for long. In the most profound... Remember, this is only two months after Pete said all this stuff. In the most profound financial change in recent Middle East history, Gulf Arabs are planning, along with China, Russia, Japan, and France, to end dollar dealings for oil, moving instead to a basket of currencies, because right now everybody has to exchange money through the dollar including the Japanese and Chinese yuan, the euro, gold, and a new unified currency planned for nations in the Gulf Cooperation Council, including Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, and Qatar. So I guess the Middle Eastern countries quietly, secretly decided that they would get one currency for the Middle East, and that's fine. I don't, I don't, that doesn't bother me, you know? It really doesn't. And they don't want to have to change through the dollar, because right now the dollar is the reserve currency, as it's called. Secret meetings have already been held by finance ministers and central bank governors in Russia, China, Japan, and Brazil. Look at what it says, folks. Read that. Secret meetings. This is the Independent. This is a very credible publication. Secret meetings have already been held by finance ministers and central bank governors in Russia, China, Japan, and Brazil to work on the scheme, which will mean that oil will no longer be priced in dollars. The plans confirmed. Look at that confirmed to the independent by both Gulf Arab and Chinese banking sources in Hong Kong, which is really the main center of the financial world, if you know what you're doing, may help to explain the sudden rise in gold prices, but it also augurs an extraordinary transition from dollar markets within nine years. Well, nine plus 2009 is 2018, right? Obviously, it didn't happen. Obviously, it didn't happen. Not yet. The Americans, who are aware that the meetings have taken place, although they have not discovered the details, are sure to fight this <clears throat> international cabal, talk about projection, which will include hitherto loyal allies, Japan and the Gulf Arabs. Well, they're trying to solve this terrible problem. How do you choke out this thing that's killing the planet? This sounds like a dangerous prediction of a future economic war between the U.S. and China over Middle East oil, yet again turning the region's conflicts into a battle for great power supremacy. The transitional currency in the move away from dollars, according to Chinese banking sources, may well be gold. 
An indication of the huge amounts involved can be gained from the wealth of Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Qatar, who together hold an estimated $2.1 trillion in U.S. dollar reserves. $2.1 trillion. Chinese financial sources believe President Barack Obama is too busy fixing the U.S. economy to concentrate on the extraordinary implications of the transition from the dollar in nine years' time. Now, they thought they were going to get that, but it didn't work because, of course, they got screwed, as always, but that's changing right now. The current deadline for the currency transition is 2008. This is right there in the U.K. Independent. Now, this is a source, a Chinese banking source. These plans will change the face of international financial transactions, one Chinese banker said. America and Britain must be very worried. You will know how worried they are by the thunder of denials that this news will generate. Oh, and there's my little angel spark. So, sure enough, uh, the denials did happen. There was one article where they, of course, wrote the classic mainstream media blow-off and said, no, 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 none of this is true. None of this is true. And then that's it. And that article you have to dig up through archive.org, and I have it. Um, I didn't have time to throw it in here. This, this is the last thing I got into the show right at the end, okay? Um, right, as I was, because that's why I was late getting started. Anyway, I don't want to delay too much longer. But anyway, the thunder of denials this will generate, 2018 is a deadline. Now, what we've heard is that this alliance was already well underway and secretly working with, Pete, Pete told me the same thing, the people who had broken away from the military that ended up going to Paris. They were working with this. This article is partly them, too. The U.S. was involved. They kept that secret. The sources maybe didn't know or didn't want to say, but elements of the U.S. were involved. Now, as of right now, you got to remember, China is six factions. The faction that's running it does not appear to have our highest good in mind at all. Internet censorship, all kinds of crazy stuff. So I'm not saying China's a good guy right now. We got a big problem there, but there's six factions, and some of those factions are good guys, okay? But not, probably not the one that's running. It sounds pretty freaking bad in a lot of ways. Um, I don't know. I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but it doesn't look good for several reasons. And if you dig up, dig up all this stuff and you read all this 17 stuff, you know what I'm talking about. <sighs> yeah, so... The 2008 economic collapse, remember, uh, McCain said the fundamentals of the economy are sound. And then like a week later, apparently that was the same alliance that did that, that, orchestrated that as much as they could back then, hoping that that would be the end of it and that people would be angry and there would be a public uprising and, and they would want answers and that's how the whole thing would unravel. Nobody expected at 26 or 29, if you talk to Ron Paul, $29 trillion bailout. That's half of all the money that exists in the entire world at the time, which is called the, the gross world product, is one of the names for it, GWP. Half of the GWP, which was about $60, billion, 60 trillion. And so this was $29 trillion, like half of all the money in the world. And they just printed it out of thin air and kept the whole thing going. And nobody knows how the heck it kept on going so long. But these guys are pushing for this. The deadline was 2018. Negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Haggle, haggle, haggle. Side deal. You know, da 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 da. Kick the can around a little longer, a little longer. The big thing apparently happened somewhere around February 16th, where the cabal, deep state stuff, the money got turned off, and they could not create bubble money anymore. Now all they can do is use real collateral that's based on solid hard assets, and I totally support that. It's because, apparently, that the finances, finances got cut off. The cabal, believe it or not, the briefings we're getting now from the alliance, the cabal is very poor. They don't have money. They don't have the money to organize a good campaign. They don't have the money to organize a good convention. And they, they're, they're really broke, folks. So they're doing cheap stuff. Dirty deeds. Done the cheap. I'm not going to joke about it too much. you got to laugh a little bit, right? Gosh. Anyway, this is all coming to a head. All these things that Pete was talking about in 2009 and what this, what this alliance was doing and, and cutting it off. February 16th is apparently when that happened, and it's been total chaos ever since. 
So they are looking for the Hail Mary pass right now, the bad guys. They're looking for that one in a million. Is it possible that we could still win? Is it possible that we could throw this thing off? Well, let's just delay the election by five months and make everybody so scared they don't even want to leave their house. We did get briefings, by the way, saying that this could get bad enough for a while that you want to have supplies in your home like food and water in case you don't feel safe going to the grocery store. I don't know if you're going to need that, but it would probably be a good idea to have some extra stuff. And again, you don't need to spend a lot of money. I don't sell survival stuff. I never try to make money when I talk about this kind of stuff. I just don't do that. Uh, It's okay if people do. Prepper supplies are great. There's great stuff you can order. I don't sell any of it. But all you really need is like rice and beans and five-gallon jugs of bottled water if you don't have good drinking water so or a good filter. So, yeah, 930, we're, we're doing really good here on time. I didn't want to go much longer than this. All right, back to the slides. And this is Peterson talking again. And I asked him this question, do you think there's ever going to be a disclosure that any of this stuff about UFOs or other races not born on Earth would ever get out to the public? And he said, I've been told that a number of the apocalypse films that have come out recently and a number of the science fiction things that have come out recently as movies have been partially funded by the government, like Stargate SG-1, Babylon 5, many, many other examples, Oblivion. I talked about they show you the spheres, they live, right? Wanting to get familiar in our minds the idea that there might be people at a point of great need on the planet who could come and help us. Well, the ETs can't do that unless you pray for them to do so. That's how you authorize this, folks. You have to pray and you have to ask them. The benevolents don't care what religion you are or if you even have a religion. All they care is that you're a loving person and that you pray. And whatever you think God is, whatever that means for you, you pray to that, whatever that is, and you ask for help. And now they can do a heck of a lot more. And that's part of why the meditation effect works so well because that is definitely a form of prayer And so you get this weird discontinuous effect where the planet gets a lot better. So they're preparing us for the idea that these beings might show up who could come and help us. And I think that's actually going to happen, honestly. There might be some kind of divine providence that would help as well. And that's what we're going through now. I've heard, kind of through the grapevine, that I know Reagan was asked to disclose such things, the truth about flying saucers and alien people. I know JFK was asked these things and said he would do something. And I know that there was pressure put to bear on both of them to say nothing. Pressure put to bear is a very carefully worded way because, of course, Reagan was shot at. And later briefings with Pete, he told me that this was because Reagan was going to disclose. He wanted to do a big, big disclosure. And so they tried to shoot him after he disclosed to his former Hollywood uh, actor friend, Jackie Gleason, Um, who had a very famous show called The Honeymooners. And there's Jackie Gleason with Nixon. And, you know, sometimes they would tell you the truth in these crazy tabloid headlines, and that actually was true. He did see, he did get to look at bodies because he was a big, big, big celebrity, and they liked him and they let him in. So he told that to Reagan, and this was that tragic day that Reagan was walking along, and somebody shot at him, and it hit Brady instead, the guy with the circle around him. Very sad, the chaos that ensued. And uh, I don't want to show these images for too long because they're pretty upsetting. That's Brady as he fell. He didn't die. He was brain damaged. Um, And so they commended him and as well it should. Now Reagan did spill the beans. He he, he let a little bit slide at a screening of the movie E.T. with Steven Spielberg. I showed you this before. He just stood up and looked around the room. This was Reagan, almost like he was doing a head count. And he said, I wanted to thank you for bringing E.T. to the White House. We really enjoyed your movie. Then he looked around the room and said, and there are a number of people in this room who know that everything on that screen is absolutely true. And people saw this. Now, how did they know that? Well, because all this black ops classified stuff was well underway by then. And we talked before. Peterson also told me this around 1985-ish is when this gigantic spherical, almost like a moon-sized object came into our solar system, artificially powered with beings inside that they called it the Seeker. And it had a door that opened up on it that was like 800 800 miles wide. And all these little uh, ships came out. And apparently, um, according to my my uncouth, sometimes uncouth friend Jacob, he said um, they they were a bunch of 
What did he say? They were a bunch of a-holes on a pleasure cruise and we told them to F off. <laughs> That's how he framed it. That's the intel I got on what the seeker was. So there's going to be really, really big stuff that we're going to learn. When we find out how big the AT crafts are, how many of them there are, that there's all these different civilizations that are around us right now, hiding out on the backside of the moon, hiding out on other planets and moons, hiding out under the earth. UFO sightings are commonplace, and they're not all people from the future. They're also extraterrestrials. And everybody has this technology where they can pop through time, and so they're making edits and... Uh, but it only works up until the solar flash, which is supposedly somewhere around 2030 or thereabouts. And after that, it's a focal point and you don't have the ability to go forward into the future with any consistency. So 2030 is about as far into our future right now as we can go with the limited technology that we have. Of course, I think the ETs have totally mastered that and can easily get past it, but we can't. So nobody from the future is going to be newer or more future than 2030 who's actually doing this stuff with the qcds and the trips back in time and building the plan and all that kind of stuff okay last little stuff here let's go back to the slide once more i know that the current president which was obama at the time i don't know this i have heard that the current president was planning to make a disclosure announcement later this year or late in the year and Kerry said, are you willing to say the date, which he had already given us? It was uh, November 17th, I believe. Uh, I know a date that I, I actually forced myself to forget the date because I didn't, never wanted to release it because I knew that would ruin it. He says, I knew a date that I was told, and I can tell you the same people who told me that date told me the U.S. currency would fail in 2001 when they ordered me to move here. So we're going to have more on that in another video because that's a long subject. It's very fascinating about... What happened to President Obama? And basically, um, to give you the very, very short synopsis of that story, uh, Obama was going to do this. They had booked uh, two hours on all the major, I think it was two hours, on all the major television shows. They were going to introduce us to five different races of human-like ETs to make it easy to start. And then um, they blocked that disclosure. It didn't happen. But Obama was going to do it anyway when he won the Nobel Prize in Oslo, Norway in December. I think it was December 4th or something like that. The night before he was going to win that award, when he's in Norway, that's when the Norway spiral happened and he could see it. Okay, now what they actually did is they created a portal with these ground-based uh, technologies that beam microwaves like HARP, H-A-A-R-P, and, and, and then you see the black circle and it opens up. I don't have all these visuals for you right now. I didn't have time. What I heard from Dr. Stephen Greer at a conference was that they told the president at the time, Obama, if you do this, if you talk tomorrow, what would happen if one of these opened up in front of Air Force One and you went through it? Then, the next morning, uh, he took the award, he didn't talk, and they restored order. But that, that same time that they did the Norway spiral, there was a tetrahedral black thing that appeared over Russia and that was also telling Russia that they could blow the hell out of them with one of these if, if, they, if they tried to talk and do disclosure. So that was a threat. That thing, by the way, it's like the TR-3B is a balloon. It's a triangular balloon, like an aircraft carrier. But then you can make it into a tetrahedron by knitting four of them together and filling it up with more air. And that's what that actually was. That's why it was kind of floating in the air, because they are balloons. But the, you can park a whole bunch of cool spaceships on them and stuff. That's one of the things we're going to learn about when we get disclosure is these uh, flying platforms. So they use that to threaten Russia, and there's some great footage of the Russian tetrahedron and, again, the Norway spiral. And then about a year later, out comes this television show called The Event where there's a black president. The first scene at the beginning of the show is that he's got this woman who's an extraterrestrial, and he's about to tell the whole world that she's extraterrestrial from another planet. And then in comes an airplane, and right as it's about to hit him, it goes through a wormhole. And it never hits him, and they run, and everybody's screaming. That was a direct allusion to the threat that they made the year before, as I heard about from Dr. Greer. I was amazed when I saw the show, and I wrote a whole bunch of articles about it on my website back in the day. We're almost done. I hear my phone going. It's probably my wife telling me to stop, but we're, we're very close now. Okay, so this is the last thing I want to tell you because it's super, super important. My first disclosure when I put it in writing of the things that Pete Peterson was telling me 
came on September 11th, 2009. And it was in this article, and I took a picture of it on my website today, Awesome New Disclosure Videos, September 11th, 2009. Uh, so what I was doing is I was releasing stuff that Pete had told me. Here's the link if you want to go look it up. And boy, my phone is blowing up. Okay. The full sequence, this is me talking based on what Pete had told me in many, many other briefings. The full sequence of events may also include some form of official or semi-official public announcement of the reality of the UFO phenomenon, which is happening now, which would certainly be a tremendous event, probably the most substantial event in modern human history, at least since the founding of any of the major world religions. That's my opinion. Apparently a major massive, this is 2009, I said this folks, from the briefings of people that heard this from the future, Apparently, a major massive economic upheaval will be the precipitating event that will usher in many of these changes. Well, it's happening right now, and it leads to UFOs, which is what we're seeing. Nonetheless, it appears that this will primarily destroy the most corrupt elements of our financial infrastructure, and what comes in the aftermath is very, very positive for the rest of us. So this is nothing new. Everything I told you in 2009 is happening now, folks. This is the conclusion. And then I wrote this other article on September 26th, them pesky time-traveling dinosaurs. I like to be a little funny. And this is what I said in that article. So it's not very long after, just like a couple weeks later. And I said, there may well be an official government announcement of five different extraterrestrial species that are human in nature. This is what Pete was saying, who we've been interacting with for over 100 years on an unofficial secret basis. That announcement could come at the same time that we have this restructuring of the financial system. Look at it, there it is. Black and white, 2009. Both of these things are starting to happen. We obviously haven't gotten the big disclosure, but you know, financial system, all that stuff, it's very, very accurate. That would be extremely interesting, let's put it that way. And then the person who was interviewing me on the radio at the time said, wow, it certainly would take your mind off the money for at least a moment. Well, yeah, I mean, think about it. That's exactly the point, isn't it? <laughs> and then they say, yeah. I forget if it was a man or a woman. It's a long time ago. So with the collapse of the financial system, this is from my article, you can go look it up. With the collapse of the financial system and the restructuring to a new order, you're going to have a lot of really juicy stuff come out at the same time. You're going to have new technology which will stimulate industry, and don't forget now, the military-industrial complex is very much tied in with aerospace technology. What do you think is going to be the natural response of most people once they find out there's ruins on other worlds from older human, other human civilizations? So I just brought this in there to show you another example of how they started to tell you the truth through fiction. The movie The Last Mimsy had this box, which is very, very similar to the Orion Cube that came from Roswell, and that's the point. And it did allow them to talk to beings in the future who could then create a conduit, and ultimately the kids go to the future and portal there. And again, this is the cube that I was talking about. So if you've been waiting a long time uh, to see that, this is what it looks like when it's open. And then the hologram on the top. This is from Dan Burrish. So I also talked about the movie, um, you know, the uh, contact, the movie. The D of the CTP is the doctrine of the convergent timeline paradox. This is the whole idea that, uh, you know, everything collapses into a singularity at the end of, uh, originally it was 2012, it now appears to have moved to 2030, but originally they did see the solar flash happening at 2012 and they couldn't look beyond it with any of these technologies and they couldn't travel beyond it. Now they are, but not back then. I don't think they realize when... I'm not sure how it works with the 2030 or 2029 and they're sending this plan back in time because uh, they would have had to get around that. But, you know, I don't have all the answers, folks. That's the Project Looking Glass thing where you have the, the barrel-shaped uh, thing with the water. If you see those white posts, a human being would be almost not as tall as they are but pretty close, so it's a gigantic object. And then when they stand there, it starts showing you in that amber-colored uh, fisheye lens distortion, what the person's pineal gland is seeing, and you can look into the future or the past and get a view of what's going on. And uh, so the, the real question, as he was saying, is which future do we choose? 
And that's where I want to end this with tonight. Uh, I want to do a brief meditation with you guys because, hey, it's a technology and it works and we need it. So let's close our eyes. Let's put both feet flat on the floor if they're not already. Or maybe you want to lie down if that's comfortable, especially if you're on the East Coast. Take a nice deep breath and let it go. And take another nice deep breath in and let it go. As you breathe deeply, imagine this feeling of perfect peace coming through you. Feel that sense of deep relaxation moving through every part of your body, relaxing every muscle, relaxing every nerve, calming yourself down. The plan is perfect. Nothing can stop what is coming. They just have been saying that again a lot recently. They know the future. They know this is going to be okay, folks. By breathing deeply right now, we're co-creating that. Coming into a deeper awareness. Releasing the stress, the tension, the fear. Moving back into trust of the perfect plan that we are all on. The ascension. The upgrading of what it means to be human on earth. A new civilization with much, much greater technology getting to meet our galactic brothers and sisters, going through this global wake-up call, this global initiation, global dark night of the soul that explodes our internal landscape and makes our souls so much more powerful so that we have new things to see, new soul potentials to discover in ourselves. As you relax, as you breathe, as you stay calm, it's okay it's okay to grieve about what's going on right now as I did. It's okay to let yourself have a release. Nothing bad will happen to you if you allow that release to happen. You are wonderful. You are a being of infinite worth. And if anyone doesn't see that about you, they are wrong. You deserve love. You deserve kindness. You deserve respect. You deserve appreciation. And you deserve to have a free, loving, peaceful society with prosperity where you have enough for everything that you need, however that comes about. We send our loving thoughts to all the members of the military in this country and in many other countries who are working to free our planet from some very dark things that have not exactly been made public yet, but we're starting to learn we send them our prayers. We hold them up in the light. We wish them the best. We wish minimal casualties when they go through the final stages of what they're going to have to do. Some of these people are very entrenched. We ask that all of these processes be guided in truth and in love and in peace. That the people making these executive decisions are guided on the principle of brotherly and sisterly love, unity, not separation, a global understanding of how we can turn this around, heal the planet, clean up our garbage, get our hover cars, start going out there, start meeting all of our friends who have been waiting so patiently for us to go through this mass global awakening. My name is David Wilcock, and I thank you for being here with me today and for participating in this meditation. I ask that you continue to meditate, and I ask that you pray whatever feels good to you. If you have any belief in a higher power, pray to that higher power for guidance and for protection and support for the earth. This will work. Every single person who does this is an exponential increase in what these beings are allowed to do. Together, we can co-create our planetary awakening. And so it is. I'm David Wilcock. This has been a very long show. I, I'm sorry. Four hours and a little bit more. But it's not five. I promised Danny and I wouldn't go five. Remember that. Thank you for watching. Hopefully I don't lose my channel. And I'll be back soon. 
Uh, I got some cool stuff going on, and uh, I will talk to you guys shortly. Thank you for being here. Please remember to stay in alignment. Please remember not to contribute to the negativity and the hatred. And you can do your part and get involved to be a part of this great, great thing. Don't get your channel taken down. You know, be careful in how you do it. But there's a lot of things we can do. And what we really need more than anything, and 17 keeps saying this, we really need everybody to start getting involved, just like me. If you don't like David Wilcox sitting on the bench, if you don't like David Wilcox, I'm sorry, I'm speaking about myself in third person. It's crazy. If you don't like me sitting on the bench, if, if it bothered you that I was gone for so long, what about you? What about you? Are you going to do something? Or are you just going to get mad at me if I don't do something? We all have to participate in this together. It's not just me. It's not just the Alliance. Don't just sit there and wait. Spread this information however you can. Call the people who are living in fear. See if you can help them get a little bit more perspective. And maybe just shine some love. Thank you all for watching. And I will see you next time.